Hi, I'm Lori with UT Southwestern Medical Center. Thanks so much for joining us today. We are here to chat with radiation oncology, uh, oncologist, excuse me, David Schur. Thank you for joining us today. And we're going to be chatting about new and emerging treatments for head and neck cancer patients. Before we start, we also want to thank Moncrief Cancer Institute in Fort Worth for their ongoing support. And as usual, don't forget to like and share the conversation and post your questions in the comments section of this stream so we can take as many questions as we can get to in the next 30 minutes. And please remember that Dr. Scheer cannot comment on specific cases due to patient privacy laws. Okay, so I think we'll get started. And I just wanted to open it up. Dr. Scherf, if you could tell us a little bit about the radiation oncology department here at UT Southwestern. You know, absolutely. I and mean, I think, you know, head and neck cancer in particular is a very you know, complicated and nuanced site to treat with radiation. Okay. Uh, or with any, sur anything, surgery, uh, chemotherapy as well. It's very nuanced. There's a lot of organs that are really important in the head and neck. Uh, and so everything in terms of treating a head and neck cancer starts with the team, you know. And sure. so, um, you have to sort of start with sort of the head and neck team at UT Southwestern, which uh, involves superb surgeons, medical oncologists, speech and swallow therapists, dietitians, et cetera. And so um, that is, you know, really one of the sort of satisfying things about working here is, is the team approach. And that kind of carries That's right great. through to the radiation department. So uh -huh. we have, you know, our own building here and it's a big group here. But um, what we try to do within our department and within our disease side in particular is sort of make it very focused by disease side and, and okay. particular head and neck cancer. So okay, great. our group, for example, has not just three head and neck radiation oncologists, it has a dedicated nurse practitioner, three head and neck specific nurses, uh, dietitians, uh, and research staff just for the head and neck team. So wow, it that's it, impressive, yeah. It's a lot, you know, uh -huh. we're, we're a busy group, you know, we're, we're a busy service, but the needs of the patients are also pretty significant, you know, sure. so we have a whole team just for that. And we have superb machines and technology and everything, but it really all starts with sort of the team, uh -huh. you know, and, and having that group there to kind of carry patients through treatment. So. Yeah, sounds like you're proud of the people on your team. Uh, you know, at the yeah. end of the day, all treatments are about people, right? You know, and sure. in terms of sort of getting someone from, uh, you know, a starting point, which is usually the, the worst time of their life, to the end point, which is finishing treatment uh, right. successfully, and all the side effects and all that that come along with that. So. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, so we're already starting to get some comments in from our audience and the first one is from Kristen thank you for posting this she says what is the most important thing you try to communicate your with your patients when discussing treatment for head and neck cancer yeah so um, you know I think the the, the first it's a I'm gonna answer this in many ways so okay. you know the first piece is making sure the patient understands what the diagnosis is so okay. where did it come from if we know where it came from where is it what is its stage how advanced is it etc um, and that helps to sort of really, you know, sort of describe and, and, and sort of help to explain the prognosis. And that's sort of the first part of any conversation, but then specifically with respect to head and neck radiation therapy, it is, it's like number one to be clear about what the patient's gonna experience. It is extremely difficult therapy. We get them through it and then they sort of thrive in the end, but it is extremely difficult and I don't want patients surprised I because okay. it can be difficult. Um, swallowing problems, pain, speech so often, sometimes, um, depending on the disease. All of these things are, to almost a patient, sort of the worst uh, time of their life, you know, the worst time swallowing, speech, sure. et cetera, and so, um, and it gets better. It, it gets better dramatically even, but if they're caught off guard by that, then it's gonna make the treatment much more difficult. So I'd rather you know, get them through step by step. I literally go week by week. The first week you'll feel this, the fifth week, the seventh week, the week after you finish. So they understand. It's not, not to scare, not to sort of uh -huh. make them sort of terrified, but just to be very clear about what is likely to happen, what may not happen, etc. It also helps to sort of explain when they, well, for the patient to understand when it happened, when these side effects happen, it's not a surprise. This is not something sure. that's more wise. It's just happening. To them. Sure, because that can be frightening, but it sounds like you give them the information they need up front. It's a balance, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You don't want to sort of overwhelm patients if they're not want, you know, ready to hear it, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time. Um, Everyone has to know, and they have to be informed. Sure. Um, well, um, I see we have another question in here, actually, from Sierra, and she would like to know how common are head and neck cancers? So, 
the first thing to realize about head and neck cancers is that it's a very diverse group of cancers. You know, it's not yeah. saying like breast cancer, which is a you know basically one or two kinds of cancer of the breast. Head and neck cancer runs the gamut from you know tongue cancer to cancers in the, in the sinuses to in the voice box and, and, and to salivary glands like the parotid glands. Oh, so wow. it's a very right. sort of diverse uh -huh. type of cancer. Okay. But all all comers, there's about um, like sixty to sixty five thousand cases of head and neck cancer per year. Um, that's about three percent of all cancers. Okay. So, so actually, I mean, in terms of the number, total number of cancers in the in the country is still relatively small. Okay. But sixty thousand is a is a good sized city. So you know, it's right. not a lot of patients every year. Um, of all of those cancers, the most rapidly diagnosed cancer now is what's called oropharynx cancer, uh, which is uh, cancer at the base of the tongue, to so the back of the tongue, and the tonsils. Okay. And so that is rapidly becoming the most commonly, now commonly diagnosed head and neck cancer uh, in the U.S. Now, I think that might relate to a question we just got in from Holly, who uh, is asking, how often do you see HPV-related head and neck cancers? So, in 2018, that is more or less the bread and butter of most head and neck departments. Really? A yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, as a tertiary care center, you know, we obviously see mm -hmm. a lot of different kinds of cancers, but even still, uh, HPV driven, HPV positive or pharynx cancer is the most uh, common uh, treatment you know, that we do. Um, and we expect it only to become you know, you know, more and more prevalent as, as time goes on. And why is that? Why do you think it's becoming more prevalent? And does it affect both men and women? Mm -hmm. So, um, as of about 20 or 30 years ago, uh, oral pharynx cancer was a very difficult diagnosis. Um, the survival rates were in the 20 to 30 percent range, depending on how people came to medical attention. That's because it was driven by smoking and drinking behaviors largely. Oh, then patients did okay. much better, and I mean dramatically better. You know, okay. the survivors were three, four times better. Okay. And it turns out that the the modern oropharynx patient um, is now their cancer, rather than being driven by uh, tobacco or alcohol, is from a virus called the human papillomavirus. Okay. And HPV or human papillomavirus is like a, it's a sort of a sexually transmitted disease, but it's like a human disease, everyone is exposed to it, and it causes head and neck cancers, also causes cervical cancers and some other cancers. But because of that, and the fact that the interval between exposure and, and actual cancer diagnosis can be decades, we're kind of only now starting oh, to see okay. patients age 40 to 60, 65 with this new sort of HPV positive oropharynx cancer. Okay, so it's a, it is something that affects you over time. The, you get infected, you know, usually in the 20s and so on, and then it just sort of lays there, and then usually in someone's 40s to 60s, if someone's going to develop the cancer, that's when they develop it. So um, the uh, exposure is many, many decades before the actual cancer. So. Okay, well, I think you've talked about, we, we're getting a question about risk factors, and um, you've mentioned some of them just now, but are there any other risk factors for head and neck cancers that we could mention? So, I mean, it is important to know that Vegas is smoking. It's like number one, two, and three okay. smoking. Um, okay. Alcohol use as well. You know, um, there are other environmental exposures that are known to, to cause head and neck cancers. Um, there are other viruses, for example, Epstein Barr virus causes a cancer called nasal pharynx cancer. Um, but because the head and neck is sort of right in so in your face, uh, it's always being exposed to stuff. You know, occupational exposures, fumes, um, things like this. Um, occupational um, uh, sort of patients such as like uh, air traffic, anyone who in an airport with those kind of fumes, um, oh. and they're kind of, you know, um, not clear associations, but basically that kind of environmental um, activity. Um, certain foods, nitrates, nitrate-containing uh, foods, uh -huh. um, the uh, betel nut, it's not something we chew in the U.S., but in South Asia, the betel nut is something that's commonly uh, chewed. Um, recreationally, that can cause cancer as well. There are some genetic factors. Um, most are not genetic. Most head and neck cancers are not genetic, and the genetic syndromes that cause head and neck cancer are actually quite rare, but that is a, a small contributor to head and neck cancer. Okay. Um, there's even now some data that bad reflux, so like heartburn, can cause some head and neck cancers. That's so pretty common, more recent, heartburn. It's, it's very common. Yeah. Um, but remember, everyone in the world has heart, at least in the United States, has heartburn. Um, but, but still, it's not a very common cancer, so there's nothing to be alarmed about, uh, except to say that, you know, there are sort of very common things that happen in the body, like acid reflux that can potentially, uh, you know, instigate, instigate some malignancies in the head and neck. 
Okay, well, thank you. That's really interesting. And we have another question in from Ryan, who is asking, what are some of the symptoms of head and neck cancer, and are there any symptoms that are easily overlooked? Yeah, so um, one of the interesting things about head and neck cancer is that it's related so tightly to daily function eating, speaking. Sure, that, yeah. So, so a lot of times, you know, that's literally how it comes to attention. You know, uh -huh. a painful swallow, a problem speaking, like hoarseness, that's very common for larynx cancers, or voice box cancers. Um, a lot of times these cancers go to the neck. So you have lymph nodes in the neck, like a painless lump. A lot of men when they're shaving, um, you notice, oh, what, what's that bump there? That's a very oh. common way of finding head and neck cancers. Okay. Um, random pains in the head and neck can also be a sign of cancer. I mean, obviously most of the time you have a Pain. It's not cancer, but whether it's pain in the ear, what's called otalgia, um, or pain in the jaw, these are also potential signs uh, uh -huh. of head and neck cancer. I would say, especially with the rise of, of oropharynx cancer, oftentimes a, a painless lump is the most common you know, sort of, um, way of finding it. Um, That's but interesting. you know, you imagine that imagine a disease site that can have cancer in the back of the nose, or nasal stuffiness, bleeding. Things oh. like this can be a, can be a um, presenting symptoms in these appearances. Interesting. Okay. Well, let's move on to, so we've talked about symptoms. Um, what about treatment? What can you tell us about treatment options for these cancers? So, you know, the first thing, again, to realize about treatment in the head and neck is that you have many different options. Um, you always think about, you know, number one is how are you going to treat the cancer where you know it is, in the head and neck. So in the primary mm -hmm. site, um, whether it's the oropharynx or the nasopharynx, as well as potential lymph nodes. So the neck is the most common place for them to go. How do you okay. treat uh, that? And that usually involves either radiation or surgery or both. Uh, and in addition to that, we also think, depending on the scenario, would chemotherapy help the patient at the same time? Mm -hmm. And now obviously I'm talking about non-metastatic cancers this sort of in terms of this discussion. Okay. Um, and then when you try and work with your surgeons and the patient to figure out, oh, should this be operated on? Should you have radiation instead? Or should you do both? You really start thinking about, number one, what's the best way of curing the cancer? And that, that's a big part of the decision. And many times, though, it's uh, the dealer's choice, but both therapies, radiation or surgery, are going to have an equal cure rate. It's just a question of preserving function. So how do we sure. sort of, um, uh, yeah. give the patient the best cancer outcome, but also have them eating and drinking and tasting and swallowing as, as, as good as possible, you know? So that's sort of the the, um, the conversation you have with your colleagues and with the patient, you know, as you start to come up with a treatment plan. Okay, okay, great. And um, in case we have anyone in the audience, I, I didn't notice that you mentioned metastatic cancer. Yeah. Would you explain what that means exactly? When, when is cancer metastatic? So uh, cancer in the head and neck, you know, starts out somewhere in the head and neck, the voice box, the the nose, the back of the throat, etc. Uh, and as it spreads, it generally spreads pre-sequentially. So it starts in the location uh, of the, the, the organ it started, and then it moves to lymph nodes in the neck. Those lymph nodes are typically here, really. You know, that's okay. where they're often felt there. But if it moves beyond that, and we often think of that below the collarbone, um, then it, it's called a metastatic cancer. Okay. And that can be in the lungs, or bones, or liver. And fortunately, actually, when most head and neck cancer presents, it's pretty rare. That it's spread outside of that area, although it does happen, um, but that would be considered metastatic disease. Okay. Sometimes, uh, after you do everything you can possible, and everything is still to quote unquote cured here, or you know, not active here, you can still develop something months to years down the road um, in a different in a different location, bone or, or lung, um, originating from the original head and cancer. That's also metastatic. metastatic. Okay. Okay. Thanks for explaining that. Okay, so we've got another question from Ryan, and I just want to pause now and say we're almost halfway through the chat, so if you've got questions, go ahead and put them in the comments field because we'll try to get to all of your questions in the time remaining. So uh, this question from Ryan, he'd like to know, are there any current clinical trials at UT Southwestern mm -hmm. for head and neck cancer? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, one of the sort of fun things about working here, uh, which is, is great for patients, is that we have a lot of active clinical trials. So we have a lot okay. of sort of novel concepts that we're, uh, we're integrating into our, our practice. Mm -hmm. So um, within the head and neck radiation group, within my group, um, we have several active clinical studies. Um, one of them, which is actually quite quickly accruing, so a lot of patients are going on to it, is a study which is limiting the amount of radiation dose and the amount of actual normal tissue being treated uh, to any radiation uh, in the neck 
with patients with oropharynx and larynx cancers. So uh, the name of the study is Infield, but more importantly, what we're trying to do is tailor the treatment to the patient. And okay. so radiation, generally speaking, causes the most side effects of all the different therapies, and that's from radiation to normal tissue, radiation to the voice box, radiation to salivary glands, etc. And so what this study does, it's eligible to pretty much any patient with oropharynx and larynx mm -hmm. cancer, mm -hmm. is to drop that dose substantially or drop it to zero. Wow. And, really? And, yeah. And so um, it's very satisfying because, you know, what we're doing is really not really risking any cancer outcome, we're just improving the quality of life, you know, which is, is yeah. really satisfying. That's, that's yeah. one study we have. We have another study that will be opening in probably about you know, six weeks, six to eight weeks, um, okay, which is focusing on um, very, very focused therapy to early stage larynx cancers. So I, I just uh, explained the study for you know, larger volume cancers you're treating the neck. Well, early stage mm -hmm. larynx cancers, uh, or voice box cancels, cancers, excuse me, is uh, very small radiation, and yet it has a lot of side effects. Uh, voice quality, swallowing, things like this, which are so integral to patients' sort of uh, dignity of their self, you know, can get permanently uh -huh. affected by the radiation. And so we did an earlier stage study, a phase one study on this, focusing just on the tumor itself. So taking radiation, treating all the vocal cords, box, and then we're changing that to treating just the little tumor itself, death, using a radiosurgery oh. approach, and rather than taking six weeks, it takes five days. And so this was a study um, that has been completed and it showed very favorable results, both in terms of voice quality and um, uh, cancer control, and we're now bringing this into a larger study. So um, it's That's a, fantastic. We're really excited about this. Mm -hmm. um, it's more accessible, say, to patients because it's, little, it's literally five days, um, and we are just treating the tumor itself. And what that leads to is voice quality that is, you know, I don't want to say indistinguishable from before their cancer, but it's it's pretty impressive. You know, you it look down the voice that. box and you barely see any evidence of previous radiation, so that's exciting. We also here are very interested in trying to actively, proactively, um, mitigate side effects and to prevent side effects. Sure. Or, or at a bare minimum, try and find a problem before it's happening so we can intervene early. And so we have a study here we call the Fitbit study, uh, where we give patients Fitbits. The Fitbit, like the, the Fitbit for yeah. exercise? Yeah. <laughs> it, it literally is that, it is that Fitbit. And okay. so, um, and they wear it basically 23 hours a day. Um, and what we're doing is correlating the outcome of the Fitbit. Are they walking? Are they sort of slumping now? Is the heart rate going up? And we're going to be correlating that um, output ultimately with side effects. Are they admitted to the hospital? Do they need fluids? Is their pain getting worse? And our larger goal is to try and create a, a, a system, uh, like a, almost like an automatic safety net. So if patients are, aren't doing well, whether they know it or not, actually, we'll be able to intervene sooner. So, That's really exciting. It sounds so, like you're monitoring their progress yeah. around the clock. Uh, pretty you know, much, you yeah. know. And But the goal, too, is sometimes other patients don't know to say something or they just, you know, they don't feel well, but they expect it. You know, we'll be able to sort of chart that and try and get a a prediction system, so mm -hmm. that we see they're kind of dragging and uh, earlier, you know, intervene, prevent, you know, going to the hospital or, or increasing pain, things like this. So we're excited about that. We also have a host of other studies um, that are just uh, sort of uh, cutting edge, but they're nationally run studies that are integrating new th novel therapies, immunotherapy with radiation. We have a, a study from, it's called the NRG for that. Um, I think the only site in North, Cal North, North Texas, but regardless, it's exciting. Uh, very it's, exciting. It's, it's trying to take sort of, uh, sort of more uh, uh, cutting edge or exciting or avant-garde, you know, systemic therapy, immunotherapy. Uh, uh, we have a lot of trials on that too for other patients, but um, we integrate that with radiation treatment. So we okay. Have that as well. Okay. Well, we had a question about are there any new treatments on the horizon? And I think we've answered that because you're talking about several new options through clinical mm -hmm. trials. I think the next question might be. If someone watching this is interested in a clinical trial, how do they get involved? Yes, yeah, so I will say, you know, UT Southwestern has a, a pretty impressive portfolio, and we're just trying to understand. of throat cancer, for example, changes in the voice, uh, feeling a uh, fullness in your throat. Yeah, so one of the uh, important things to remember is that the vast majority of, side, of, of, of symptoms in the head and neck is from something benign. Allergies, um, some you know, inflammatory process for whatever reasons. Generally speaking, that's what happens. You know, 
know, when you end up in my office, that's because something bad has happened, you know, um, but that is still a much rarer uh, uh, scenario, you know, than uh, a more common side effect leading to, you know, the diagnosis of cancer. That okay. being said, yeah, you know, certainly um, anytime there's something abnormal, especially if you've never had it before, it, it could be a sign, you know, and um, while certainly many times uh, patients develop a, a symptom and they go right to the primary care doc and the primary care doc sends them right to the oncologist, yes, certainly many times, um, you know, the patients and physicians are chasing a, a different diagnosis that ends up you know, being, being incorrect. Um, and it certainly by all means, anytime there's a new question or problem, you know, in the head and neck, you, you should seek attention, you know, uh, usually sure. with an internist. Um, but yeah, most of the time, it's a good thing. Um, symptoms, signs, you know, in, in the head and neck from the nose all the, all the way down is, is something that's more benign and, and less concerning. Okay, well, that's reassuring to hear. Um, we have another question from Sierra who would like to know, does head and neck cancer affect a certain age group more than any other, or is it across age group? Uh, unfortunately, it's across all age groups. Um, okay. You know, um, the, depending on the disease, the age um, prevalence is a little bit different. Um, so for HPV positive or affairs cancer, on the average, the, the median age is about 55. Um, but for HPV negative cancer, for patients who have some more smoking related diseases, it's older, it's more in the mid 60s. Oh, you know, because okay. the HPV positive cancer comes to attention earlier. Um, oral cavity cancer, that's kind of similar, you know, between 50 and 70. But there is a, you know, unfortunately, a small group of younger patients as well who, who can get these cancers. Okay. What, why it happens in, in situations like that? So sometimes it's an unknown cause. In, in fact, time. You know, honestly, uh, when you think about the many, many hundreds of millions of people who smoke, you know, still most of them don't get cancer. So there's something else <laughs> there that is driving yeah. that, that's driving that, right? Um, whether it's uh, genetic or you know, probably bad luck. Um, yeah, most of the most of the um, true causes are beyond an instigator, like a, a toxin, like smoking or alcohol. Yeah, it's unknown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I want to remind everyone that we have about five minutes left, so please send your questions in now. And uh, let's see, we've got a question that came in ahead of the chat that um, it is about us getting a second primary cancer. So how can people who've had head and neck cancer reduce their risk of getting a second cancer? Yeah. This is a crucial point. Okay. Um, because uh, the risk of getting a second cancer after head and neck cancer uh, is uh, as high as 5% per year, depending on the, um, the cause of the cancer. So, for patients who have a smoking-related cancer, um, you know, five percent per year is, is pretty high. Yes. So, um, the number one, two, three, and four thing you can do is, is stop smoking and abstain from, from routine alcohol use. Um, okay. You know, the the these compounds are irritants. You know, they're chronic irritants of the airways and of the mouth, and um, chronic exposure is just going to cause uh, continued uh, you know cancer development. So that's okay. the number one. Um, and honestly, that's probably the best advice that I have because all other interventions aren't, frankly, shown, you know, to, to improve, uh, you know, subsequent cancer outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly remaining vigilant and going to see your doctor, you know, and it sounds trivial, but most of the time, second cancers are found by the physician, um, uh, or I should say, they could be detected by the physician, you know, meaning, you know, you do a camera, you look in, you do a good exam, uh, and they can see it, you know, by doing a relatively easy, cheap cast examination, you know, whether it's the okay. head neck surgeon or the radiation oncologist by doing a good look, honestly, that can give us a good um, view of how the patient's doing in terms of um, second cancers. Okay, thank you. So we have a couple more questions that have come in. Uh, one is from Ryan, and he would like to know what foods or liquids should head and can neck cancer patients avoid? Are there certain diets to follow or certain foods to avoid? Um, you know, so the first thing is people ask, you know, sugar bad. Uh, no, sugar, oh. sugar isn't bad. Sugar is great. We should all love sugar. Uh, it's, the, it's delicious. Okay. Um, you know, it, it, does, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't feed cancer. Um, uh, okay. Because that is a very common question. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, be, just be healthy. Nothing crazy. Um, when, when you're on radiation treatment, um, antioxidants are not helpful. Antioxidants work against the radiation, actually. Radiation uh, therapy works by oxidizing the cancer. It uses... Um, the energy to create free radicals, which kill the cancer cells. Normally, we think of free radicals. That's really interesting. Yeah. You're usually, the reverse. Like free uh -huh. radicals are bad. And generally, like in life, free radicals are bad um, unless you're getting radiation. Uh, and so, um, when people are eating their, their sort of eating and, and, and drinking during radiation therapy, 
normal diet, high in protein, high in calories. But you know, apart from being on treatment, being healthy, you know, and, and you know, the important thing is after you've gone past the uh, the diagnosis and you're doing well, you know, be healthy, you know, and and that involves you know a normal diet, whatever that is, you mm -hmm. know, not, not too high in you know uh, fat or sugar or whatever the right. your nutritionist tells you these days. Just like the usual good advice, healthy lifestyle. Pretty much, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's there's pretty good evidence that on treatment, on radiation treatment, that people who are exercising do better. You know, whether that's aerobic activity like walking or you know, like more like lifting, uh -huh. Um, uh -huh. and that could be some, you know, and, you know how do I put this? Uh, good humors that are released by it. You know, whether uh -huh. it's adrenaline and things like this. Um, whether that's the same behavior as the true with after the treatment, nobody knows. Had neck cancer, but there's pretty good evidence of other cancers that. Um, you know, maintaining a you know a, a non-obese body uh, habitus, you know, basically sure. being in shape uh, and activity is important to prevent subsequent cancer. Okay. Don't know if it's as true in the head and neck, but it's definitely true in other parts of the body. Okay, good to hear. Um, and we also got a question. Let's see here. Um, sorry, I had a, several questions come in at the same time here. Um, we have Brittany who asked if. Is head and neck cancer more common in men or women? Uh, more common in men. Yeah, and it's why a, would that be? So it's about a two to three to one ratio. Um, generally, historically, that has been due to more smoking behavior in men and drinking behavior in men. Um, but actually, interesting now with HPV positive or oropharynx cancer, that's much more common in men. Okay. So um, the ratio has gotten probably a little bit bigger, actually. Okay. So um, the HPV positive. Uh, So the, the, the gap is wide. Okay, okay. And another question that came in, or actually this was a comment from Jared. He wanted to thank you for his treatment. He says he's doing great and thanks so much for his treatment. So that's a positive thing. Thank you, Jared, for commenting on that. Right. Yeah, it's good to hear from you. And uh, one final question, because we are about to wrap up, and this is probably something that may have happened to more than one person. Um, this is from Vicki who says that she had a, a wart removed from her lip and then this winter she had a growth um, in her nostril and it was uh, removed and sent for biopsy. And should she be concerned? And that sounds like a little bit like a specific patient concern, but is there anything that you can say about warts or growths in, in a nostril that might be useful? It's, it's in, well, what I, I can't comment on a specific patient right. situation except to say that um, a lot of uh, tumors in the head and neck, as we've discussed now, are caused by viruses, you know, um, or, or pharynx cancers caused by HPV, um, there are actually even some sinus cancers that can be caused by certain flavors of HPV, other kinds of HPV, nasopharynx cancers, also a virus. Everybody, uh, thank you for joining us and ask you to please share this with your friends and Stay tuned for our next Facebook Live next week, which will actually be on childhood obesity. That's on Tuesday, the 13th at noon.